Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk today uh, as part of the Cardiac Group. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to be presenting this data today. Uh, I'm also going to the assays that we've been using, but as you saw on Julie's uh, initial slide, these are not the only assays that we've been using. We have contractility assays and seahorse for mitochondrial metabolism assays, and uh, actually a quite good and comprehensive set of assays uh, that will be tested with the botanical extracts. Uh, one thing that is very interesting about being part of this consortium and uh, my slides are not moving. And of course that when we test, everything was working perfectly, but right now, so, so this is just two disclosures that I'm a former consultant for car toxins and biosis. And one thing that is important and very interesting is that uh, we have, if we think about the word, we see the use of botanicals all over the place. And it's amazing that uh, we see like, Dr. Steinhoff and uh, Mallory were presenting how is the network for, for checking for PA compounds. And then we had Kiki responding on the, uh, on the uh, chat that actually in most African countries, and I would add like pretty much uh, Latin American countries as well, we don't have like a very good safety network or screening network uh, for botanical compounds. So uh, here you can see see like we have traditional herbalists that just have a stand in the middle of the road in the middle of the street and that they're selling all types of of uh herbals and then they also mix it and they make those concoctions as you see here on the right side and they're very popular in many latin american uh, countries um, so we use human induced pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes to do cardio safety screening uh, a while ago, in 2018, there was a paper coming out of the SIPA initiative that validated uh, stem cell lines for uh, uh, derived stem, uh, cardiomyocytes derived from stem cell lines for cardiac safety screening, but those were for small molecules, not for complex mixtures. So why, why do we use this model? I think that the first thing that is very important to note is that those are human models. So they respond pretty much like human uh, hearts instead of uh, mouse models in which uh, the bit rate is different and even the composition of uh, ion channels on the surface of the cardiomyocytes vary in comparison to the humans. The other thing is that they are a renewable resource. So once you get a specific cell line, in theory, you can keep differentiating those cells ad infinitum and as many times as you want, and as far as you you uh, guarantee that there is the appropriate genetic integrity of those cells. They have the appropriate gene expression, and also they have in intracellular organelles that are the same, same organelles that we observe in the heart. And why this is important in comparison to, uh, for example, heterologous systems in which you overexpress channels. One thing, simple reason is for example, the sarcomeres in the cardiomyocytes are the biggest buffer system for calcium in that kind of cell. Uh, and you don't see those in hack cells or CHO cells. They have appropriate drug response, uh, appropriate response to drugs, and they are predictive of arrhythmogenic risk as published by Vargas and Blinova in 2017 and 18, Kanda, and even our groups and many others. But there are two big criticisms to the model, right? When you're giving a talk, there's the, you know, always someone that asks about maturation of the cardiomyocytes and also population representation. We were able uh, at U of M uh, with uh, Todd Heron to, uh, to tackle the maturation of cardiomyocytes, especially in 2D models. And I'm gonna show a little bit about that for you. And the population representation is really important, but it still uh, depends on the use of multiple cell lines and might make it um, a little bit more difficult to, to actually have a, a good panel that represents uh, the population of a specific country. 
Uh, although I, I would like to say that a lot of biology was learned on hack cells and HeLa cells, and those were only one individual represented there. So moving on, I would like to show to you here, you can see this tiny circle that is attaching to the matrix and turning into a rod shaped uh, a rod shaped cell. So this is a cardiomyocyte transitioning from a circular shape to a rod shaped uh, morphology, which is indicative of uh, a maturation of the cardiomyocyte. Uh, when we first saw that, our technician uh, at the lab at the time came and said, hey, something weird happened to the cells. They are all elongated. We went to there and look at that. And we thought that it was too good to be true as and as good scientists, right? If you touch uh, a knob and it zaps you, a regular person would just say like, I guess I shouldn't do that again. But we were like, oh, will that happen again if I, if I touch the knob? So we kept going on. And uh, what we observed is that uh, when we put these cells on a specific matrix that's called matrix plus that comes from uh, amniotic fluid uh, human cells, uh, the cells spontaneously turn into rod-shaped cells. Uh, this is our latest publication. Uh, it wasn't uh, intended to show maturation of the cells, but the reviewer asked for more of that. So here you can see on the left, staining with JC1. JC1 is, is a, a dye that dimerizes when there is high mitochondrial potential, and it is a monomer in lower mitochondrial potential. So you give you do a, a ratio between red and green, and you get a, a, a view on the mitochondrial potential. So when the cells are put on matrix plus instead of matrix gel, which is a traditional matrix used for the cells, you can see that there is an increase in the mitochondrial potential ratio uh, which indicates that these cells uh, have a better uh, metabolic health. On the right side here, you can see that the cells in matrigel, they are uh, circular, and that uh, the sarcomeres are more or less organized on a perimeter uh, morphology. Here you see the analysis of the tracing, and you see that in some port, port, uh, parts here, uh, the sarcomeres are not very well organized. And when we have the cells on this matrix plus, the cells get rod shaped and you have a very regular and well-formed uh, sarcomeres along the axis of these cells. We've measured sarcomere lens, which is the space between this, the, the two Z bands in a, in a sarcomere. And there is a significant development of spacing between the sarcomere uh, and this is compatible to adult cardiomyocytes. Uh, we also measured circularity index since the rod shaped cells are considered to be uh, some the more mature cells and uh, the conduction velocity, which indicates the connectivity between the cells and it was also increased. This is some data from the from the original uh, paper that we've published in 2020 after we identified uh, this matrix. So here you can see uh, the CTNI expression, right? Uh, it increases when we keep the cells on this matrix. Uh, and this is an isoform of troponin I that is only expressed in adult cardiomyocytes. In fetal cardiomyocytes, it's O skeleton uh, troponin I that is expressed. And more importantly for us at the time, and it's still now, is that when we use the cells, we grow the cells on Matrix Plus, and we expose the cells to those 24 drugs that were listed in the CIPA study uh, and classified by the FDA as high risk, intermediate risk, low and low risk. Uh, we can directly observe uh, arrhythmias in the wells. So the data that you're seeing here is the number of wells that had arrhythmias in it instead of being just a surrogate of an arrhythmia as an APD-80 prolongation, we were actually able to see the arrhythmias happening within the wells. So when the cells were in these uh, matrix, in the high risk, uh, most of them had arrhythmias except for Bepardil. Intermediate risk, more or less, uh, 
uh, half of the cell, the, the wells had uh, arrhythmias that we were able to, to uh, visualize. And uh, in the low risk group, only Metropole had two wells that had uh, arrhythmias that were observed directly uh, in the videos. Uh, and when the cells were grown on Matrigel, we couldn't see the arrhythmias directly. It doesn't mean that there was not an effect on some uh, surrogates for arrhythmogenesis, but we could not see the arrhythmias themselves happening in the wells, except of, with clozapine in a single well. Uh, said that, let's explain how we get this uh, type of data. So we did not invent the wheel. Uh, guys have been around since the 70s, but in, in the cardiac field, it really got traction in the 90s. But at that time, people were using those dyes in um, whole hearts. And the modalities that we use in these uh, cardiac research is that there are dyes that produce fluorescence or they change fluorescence depending on the voltage of the membrane. So these dyes, they bind to the extracellular membrane of the cardiomyocytes and they change fluorescence every time that there is a change in voltage. So for example, di eight and apps, when there is a change in voltage, it actually decreases the fluorescence and you kind of have like a negative image of your action potential. And flow vote, it actually increases the fluorescence when you have a change in voltage and then you can measure, uh, you can measure the change in the action potential. Uh, calcium, there are several dyes that can be used. Fura is a ratiometric dye that people that work with whole hearts uh, like to use because then the signal and the outcomes that you receive, they don't depend on how thick the tissue is because it's ratiometric. Uh, flow 4 am is a good dye, has a pretty, uh, a pretty strong uh, signal. Uh, the nevertheless, nevertheless uh, when we, we test it with, uh, side by side with a voltage dye, we see that it has the ability to interfere with the uh, spontaneous pacemaker of those cells. Uh, we did the same kind of study uh, with Calbright after people from Fujifilm CDI referred this dye to us, and we did not see any significant change in pacemaker activity. And more recently, we've been using genetically encoded uh, sensors like GCAMP F6 that binds to calcium, and we're starting to work on a uh, another uh, genetically encoded sensor called ASAP3 uh, that we want to validate for the cardiomyocytes. Uh, and the reason why we use these genetically encoded sensors is because once we apply these cells, uh, apply these to the cells, we can actually do longitudinal studies. Because, for example, on the GCAMP, in the case of GCAMP we were able to successfully uh, map the change in intracellular calcium for up to one month in the same set of cells, right? So after you apply those dyes, the way that we, uh, the way that we uh, collect the data is that we have a LED assay that shines blue, lights, uh, blue light to the cells and it collects uh, green fluorescence with a, CCD camera that is high speed. Uh, and it's important to differentiate that the CCD camera is important here because it gives you uh, information, uh, positional information, right? So you know how long it point A to B uh, for this fluorescence to spread um, and allows us to calculate conduction velocity. So this is the machine that I, we developed when I was a consultant for car talks. And on the right panel, you can see uh, a 96 well plate and all the data collected together uh, in the analysis software that we developed to go with this uh, piece of equipment. So here you can see how it looks like after you process your movies, you can see all the wells and they're flashing in a green light. And that green light is that what we use to uh, calculate the action potentials or the intracellular calcium transients and how they propagate through the well.
here there are some uh, measure with the optical mapping. So the first one is the frequency that you see here on the left panel on the bottom, that it is calculated using the interbeat interval. Uh, but then we express this as frequency. So we express this in general in Hertz because it's easier for the general public to understand Hertz, right? Then, because it is one beat per second, uh, it's easier to understand than cycle length. Although in cardiology, most of the people prefer to use uh, cycle length. Uh, the other parameter that is very important is the action potential duration. So you see here on number two, there is a small square, and that is the action potential duration at 80% of repolarization of the action potential. Uh, then on the, the top right side, you can see uh, number four, which is the upstroke slope. And here we're starting to dissect a little bit more uh, on the components of the action potential. The upstroke slope is actually a function of the sodium channel uh, activation. And, oh, here, I also forgot to mention the action, which is number three that is shown here and corresponds to the plateau phase in which you are actually checking what is the effect of a given compound on the potassium channel activations. So we have, a surrogate for sodium channel activation and a surrogate for potassium channel activation. And as I mentioned, the conduction velocity is uh, obtained by measuring how fast the signal goes from A to B. And that is a very important uh, parameter because uh, a slow enough conduction velocity is believed to be one of the main factors for arrhythmogenesis. So the parameters measured for calcium are a little bit similar. We measured the frequency, uh, the calcium transient duration at 80% of calcium reuptake. Uh, the, calcium uh, the calcium transient triangulation is also a very important measurement because every time the calcium comes out of the sarcoplasmatic reticulum, it is pumped back into there, uh, into the reticulum by the circa pump and transient triangulation is a function of the circa pump. And if calcium doesn't go back into the SR, the cells cannot relax. And you have something that's called the diastolic dysfunction uh, that is common to older people, people that have uh, efficiency. Uh, the baseline fluorescence also tells you like how much calcium is in the cytoplasm at a time. And with the amplitude, of these, uh, the amplitude of the fluorescence, it can indicate if there is intracellular calcium overload or not in these cells. Uh, the upstroke slope is how fast the rhyonotine receptors open to release this calcium. So some compounds can block or make it leakier. Uh, and the is a pretty similar parameter to the one that I just uh, described for you. So here we have voltage and calcium assays uh, put side by side. So here we have voltage me measurement on panel A and Calbright for calcium measurement on panel B. And there are some of those uh, parameters that we observe. And at some level, they really match. For example, the beat rate is pretty similar uh, between the two. The conduction velocity is similar as uh, the action potentials are always preceding and shorter than the calcium transient durations, and this is reflected here. So this difference between them uh, between them is actually normal and desirable. And as I mentioned, uh, the calcium triangulation and the action potential triangulation, they actually correspond and they follow what we observed in the APD80 and the, in the APD80 and the CATD80. Uh, with those tools that we've developed, we can also generate heat maps. As you can see here, we have APD30 and calcium transient duration at 30% of recapture. Uh, and uh, those indicates the difference in how they, uh, they correspond. 
Uh, here is for uh, some of you to see if there are important components of the uh, beta adrenergic signaling uh, in those cells. Here we have on the left side all those parameters from the baseline, which means that before adding the drug and then after adding the drug. So the cardiomyocytes, they really show that there is a chronotropic effect. So this is like an adrenaline injection. So every time that you have an adrenaline injection, you have an increase in beat rate. And this is shown here. And there is also more calcium because the heart needs to contract harder when you have a beta adrenergic stimulation, when you have this adrenaline discharge. But there is also something that is called the loser because the calcium transient duration shortens, uh, which means that it's letting the heart uh, relax faster. So this whole system is preserved in those cardiomyocytes, and we can definitely uh, we can definitely follow how they work and if there's any alterations uh, of the system. So I'm going to show to you just three uh, assays. We've already tested botanical extracts, but I want to show just three of them for the sake of time and not to cause like any, uh, uh, you know, like delays on the presentation. So the cell types that we've used are ventricular IPS-derived cardiomyocytes produced by I-cell, uh, by, uh, and they're called I-cell square. Uh, and they are from Fujifilm CDI. They were cultured on Matrix Plus for seven days with RPMI and B27. So this medium has protein and they were infected on day four with this uh, adenovirus that, that uh, encodes GCAMP uh, F6 and day four of maturation. And then the assays were run on day seven. We actually uh, were able to titrate when the expression of the genetically encoded sensor uh, reached a peak. Um, and it is about three days after the infections. After that, we did uh, exposure to 0 0.04, 2 or 10 micrograms per, per ml of each botanical extracts. And we did optical mappings at 30 minutes, one hour, 24, 48, 72, and 96 hours uh, of continuous exposures. Uh, because we're using a medium that is uh, phenol red free, uh, we can run these assays without changing, without the need of changing the media of the cells and then returning them to, to that medium. Of course, the cells have media chains every 48 hours, uh, as indicated by SIPA uh, for the chronic studies uh, that they were just performing, uh, but we don't have additional media chains. For these specific plates, we did a terminal assay that was mitosoc sustaining for mitochondrial superoxide, and I'm not showing this data. And after that, we still collected cells for RNA extractions, and we're going to probe for two genes, which are MPPA, and they encode AMP and BMP. Uh, we selected those two genes because when you talk about cardiotoxicity, this is what clinicians ask for first, because those are very well-established uh, cardiotoxicity markers uh, used in the clinic. So here we have the effect of, uh, or let's say the, the lack of effect of ginseng, uh, although at 10 uh, micrograms per ml, there was a slight reduction in the spontaneous beat rate. We did not see that there is more uh, calcium uh, triangulation uh, more, more uh, an, an increase in duration at 80%. But in this case, the calcium uh, transient triangulation, which, in, which shows the function of the, the circuit uh, pump, uh, was a little bit prolonged. Uh, there were no changes in uh, the upstroke slope, which indicates no change in the calcium intracellular release. and uh, the fluorescence amplitude or the calcium baseline. So I, I chose to uh, show the data from Yohimbi and Aconite. That's what you're gonna see the next uh, because they kind of have 
uh, opposite effect literature. Um, it's known that Yohimbi has indole alkaloids that are uh, sodium channel blockers at low dose and calcium channel blockers at higher dose. So here we see that the frequency of spontaneous calcium transients uh, decreased with the increase of dose and the calcium transient duration actually got prolonged. It, prolonged. So in general, the calcium transient duration uh, shortens if the bit rate increase and gets prolonged if there is a decrease in bit rate. Uh, but we can see that at a higher dose, that calcium triangulation that corresponds to the function of the circuit pump is actually very prolonged. Uh, the upstroke transient uh, is reduced at the highest dose, but we didn't see any significant change in conduction velocity. And the data that we observe with the calcium fluorescence, the baseline and the amplitude, they did not show a consistent effect uh, on that, that would lead us to say that this compound or this extract actually cause uh, intracellular calcium overload. And at last, here we have uh, aconite, aconite alkaloids, and are reported in the literature to shorten APD and produce tachycardia. So we see the frequency of spontaneous uh, calcium transients uh, really increasing, uh, especially at the highest dose, which reduce the calcium transient duration, uh, as you can see on the next panel on A2 and A10, at 2 micrograms per ml and 10 micrograms per ml. Uh, the calcium triangulation also has uh, suffered uh, uh, a slowing uh, when we uh, use uh, aconite, so at two micrograms per ml and 10 micrograms per ml, there is a slowing of this uh, triangulation. And we did not see any change. So there is a change in recapture of calcium, but not in the release of intracellular calcium. There were no effects observed on conduction velocity and neither the calcium uh, fluorescence baseline or in the amplitude of these uh, using an aconite, which does not indicate a state of intracellular calcium overload. And oh. uh, I forgot to mention uh, in the beginning, all this data that I'm showing is at one hour. We're still analyzing all the data from other time points. Uh, and it doesn't mean that uh, oh. that these results is, are still true if we do a uh, 48-hour uh, uh, analysis, for example, you can have an intracellular uh, calcium overload that builds over time, but it's not reflected here at one hour. Uh, we're still analyzing the data because there are like 12. Yeah, so far we have 12 compounds with all these time points. Uh, that's what we're working on right now. Uh, with that, I would really like to thank. Uh, to HASI and the Botanical Safety Consortium because uh, it has been like wonderful to work with Connie, Julie, Michelle, and Jennifer pops in and out of the meetings once in a while. And the wonderful team of colleagues that we have at the BSC uh, would also like to talk to CVC Regeneration Corps, uh, which is led by Todd Heron and the people in the lab that have been uh, helping with this project, like Paul Koslowski, Ari, and Kim, uh, and also the Michigan Biology of Aging, uh, Cardiovascular Aging for startup funds for, for my lab. Uh, I would like to know any questions. Um, Thanks, Andre. Uh, there was one question put into the chat from Jessica Palmer. Uh, are you including any assays that evaluate or predict structural cardiotoxicity? So this might be for the cardiotoxicity group at large. Yes. So this is a this is a uh, wonderful question. That's pretty good. Uh, at this at this time, I am not uh, because we're collecting at the end for RNA. 
but we're going to repeat those uh, assays uh, for uh, voltage measurements, and we can definitely uh, use a high content uh, image acquisition system that, that we have. We have like a Citation 5 and also a uh, Incusite that we can use for high throughput uh, collection of images and performing uh, sarcomere staining. It's fairly, fairly simple. You can do that even just using phalloidine uh, and get the F action stained, or you can do regular immunostaining. Uh, and with the high content imagers, uh, it's it's pretty simple. Uh, we have data on mitochondria and mitochondria distribution because we're using mitosox and it's all uh, image uh, image based method. But we only collected at day four 